Malcolm Graham, a member of the Charlotte City Council, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to a, a town hall meeting focusing on the city of Charlotte in general, but specifically Charlotte City Council District 2. Um, thank the very public for watching us via the government channel, our Facebook page, as well as YouTube. If there's any questions along the way, please feel free to um, ask those questions via those social media channels. Also, you can um, leave a message in our chat room as well. So we hope this is an informative 60 minutes for you. We have some very, very uh, special guests, um, our city manager, uh, our director of housing, uh, our police chief, uh, transportation director, and uh, Sherry Grant, who's all things corridor as well. We believe that next 60 minutes is going to really be informative, talking specifically about uh, our city and our district. Um, but before we get started, uh, and I think it's really good to kind of put everything in perspective in terms of our city. I mean, the city manager um, often tends to get uh, overshadowed by the council or the mayor. Uh, but in reality, uh, his job is so important in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of our government. Um, uh, over 6,000 employees. Uh, he is a mover and a shaker that uh, people really do uh, uh, not see a lot. And I thought it would be really appropriate for us to start tonight's conversation with him, um, Marcus Jones, uh, who's been our city manager for a number of years now. Uh, I really, really do respect uh, working with him. Uh, he is an honest broker, uh, really cares about our community. And so I invited Marcus to come on board tonight to kind of share his perspective in terms of where we were in last year in terms of fighting COVID-19 and planning for a national convention that didn't come and the success that we made in terms of housing and a wide variety of issues that he touched. And so I want him to kind of talk a little bit about that as well as springboard forward in terms of the council strategy session that we had in January and his outlook for the city in general as we move forward and then specifically some of the things that we'll be seeing in, um, in District 2. So I, I welcome um, uh, Marcus Jones, our city manager, and, and, and welcome to uh, this community conversation and our, and our town hall meeting, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. Thank you for your, your kind words. I, I will tell you that it, uh, I've been doing this for, I guess, about a quarter of a century or more in terms of, of public service and, and, and management at the um, state and local level. And there's nothing more rewarding than being a city manager. I will tell you, if you were to survey a bunch of us, um, many of us would say that the last year has been the most difficult year of our professional careers. When you start to think about the pandemic and you start to think about the civil unrest and things that are happening throughout our communities, it, it, it's been tough, but I will tell you I'm very fortunate to be here in Charlotte because Charlotte is different than any other place I've ever been before. And what I love about the city, and I use the term love, is that the community builders that we have here, and it's always felt like home for day one. And I've been here about four years. So I'm excited. If uh, Charlotte is a stock, I'm investing because what we're doing is, is something that I think is somewhat unique. We listen. We listen to our residents. We listen to people in our community, our neighbors, as opposed to uh, being in the building. So, for instance, I'm in my office in the government center right now. And if I think that I can resolve it all in this office, um, I, I, I'm a fool. So what I would say to you is tonight, what uh, you have are some of the superstars that are part of this team. Uh, I'm going to add 2,000 more employees, uh, Mr. Graham. So we have about 8,000 employees, and we do everything from paved streets to pick up trash to keep you safe, okay? And we have a bunch of superstars, and tonight you will hear from Pam Weidman and Chief Jennings and John Lewis and Cherry Grant, and we'll talk a little bit about why we're all excited about the city. I will tell you that in terms of the pandemic, I, I believe what really changed it for us is the ability for the council to work with, with uh, the staff and with me in the community to see what's important, whether it's small businesses or whether it's keeping people in their homes or, or housing, it was a very different approach than many uh, jurisdictions uh, took, including focusing on even arts. So very proud of how the, the city was able to deploy funds 
but that's just part of the story. I think the bigger story is, you know, who we are. And one of my, uh, there's many ups and downs as being a city manager. It's you got great days and not so great days. And one of uh, those not so great days was a few years ago, right after we introduced the budget. And I went to the Tuesday morning of breakfast and I was talking about a $2.6 billion budget. Cherry is laughing at me. She remembers this. I was talking about a $2.6 billion budget. And uh, I talked a bit about $150,000 coming to the West side. And some of my close friends and fraternity brothers were in there and they were high-fiving it and basically saying, man, you missed the whole purpose of the meeting. It's what we haven't been getting. And to come here today and talk about $150,000 on a $2.6 billion budget is an insult. So I went back uh, to the team uh, that Wednesday morning. I had a team meeting and I talked about it and we said never again. And so what we've been able to do as we start to think about this wonderful city that we, we're in, no matter where you live, um, no matter who you love, you should have an opportunity. There should be upward mobility. There should be chances and jobs and great places to live in great neighborhoods. And that's the lens that, that we operate through. So whether we're talking about um, upward mobility or whether we're talking about safe communities, we have this lens that wherever you live in the city, there should be opportunities for you your family and your community. So let's fast forward a couple of years. We, uh, you're here from Pam Weidman uh, tonight and the council took a bold move a couple of bond cycles ago where they took this $15 million trust fund, which helps us build affordable units. And they, they took a leap of faith and went to $50 million. And you know what? The private sector came in and said, we'll match you. That's part of what I would call the secret sauce is that it's not that we do it alone, as in those of us in public service, we bring along the community, we bring it along the philanthropic community and the business community. And you'll hear more and more about how the business community partners with us. I, I will say that we took something that people would consider maybe not good. We, we talked about crime in our hot spots, and those hot spots changed from hot spots to priority areas from priority areas to corridors of opportunity. And in those corridors of opportunity, you will hear from Terry to, tonight, uh, we, we have $25 million invested in those six corridors, starting off with Babies Ford Road, where you have individuals who haven't had opportunities to develop Class A office space doing it, okay? And that's exciting. And what I'll say to you, spoiler alert, we're not stopping with the first 25 million. Uh, we are day in and day night, and day in and day out, challenging the private sector to, to match us. And we'll do more from a public sector standpoint in the 2022 budget. So again, what, what I would say is that as you talk with us tonight, I think you will see a common theme. The column, common theme is you have a group of professionals who I believe get it. Uh, and I haven't even begun to talk about what Chief Jennings is going to speak with you about in terms of, you know, we have a police chief that doesn't just talk about fighting crime. He talks about jobs. He talks about how you can make a community better. We, we have a, a housing director who doesn't just talk about housing. She talks about, you know, how can we make sure people get from their homes to good paying jobs? And, you know, uh, John Lewis is going to talk tonight about a $12 billion, that's a B, a $12 billion transformational project that I believe is going to set Charlotte apart from every other city that's in the space competing with us. So very excited. I, I promised that uh, Councilmember Graham that I, I wouldn't take the whole show. I get excited when I talk about our team, love the team, love the city. And more so than anything else, thank you for just receiving us and accepting us. And I hear you have to be here for 30 years to be a Charlottean. I hope you'll let me get there in a much shorter time. But uh, thanks for having me here tonight, Mr. Graham. Well, thank you, uh, Manager Jones, for setting the table for us tonight. Um, we, we Again, I, I really enjoy working with you and the leadership that you have 
uh, provided uh, the city uh, on a number of issues. And uh, certainly we look forward to um, hearing from your colleagues that you work with. Uh, thank you again, Manager Jones. And uh, we, uh, we're gonna kick this thing off um, talking about housing. And, and that's one of the subjects that uh, that's really there and, and near to me. Uh, the mayor uh, appointed me as chairman of the Great Neighborhoods Committee, which really dealt with affordable housing, quarters, and, and a number of issues in our community. And I had the fortunate opportunity to work with the director of housing and neighborhood service, Pamela Leibman, uh, who is no stranger to um, city government. Uh, she worked her way up the ranks um, uh, in terms of being a city employee. Uh, and has done a really, really good job in terms of serving the city of Charlotte uh, from a housing perspective. Uh, great job last year in terms of helping us through our COVID-19 um, housing task force. And so we're going to break her up to talk um, about housing, give us an overview of things that we accomplished last year, and more importantly, some of the things that we're going to be doing this year. And so I'm excited to uh, welcome um, Pamela Leitman um, to the uh, stage. And, Ms. Weidman, the, uh, the show is yours. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Graham and, and to my esteemed panelists and to um, this very fine district. Um, I like to tell the story that uh, my first stop in Charlotte was in this district. It was along the Beatty Sport Road Quarter at the um, home of JCSU. And so I'm very, very proud of that. In terms of housing, um, you will often hear me say that I believe everyone deserves a safe, decent, affordable place to call home. You will also, often also hear me say that um, the city cannot do it alone, and so it is a collective community effort. And saying all that, I am very, very proud to work with the people um, that I do from the city, from both an elected official perspective, uh, with Mr. Graham leading the Great Neighborhoods Committee, our city manager, to, and the team that um, that I get to work with every day to really help get this done. And not just the team in Housing and Neighborhood Services, but the team across um, the city who really helps to get this done. There is no Housing Trust Fund development without Charlotte Water, without um, the Planning Department, um, and without the Transportation Department. And so in terms of um, what we've done over this past year, Mr. Graham often pushes me and reminds me that we don't tell our story. And so that's what we're attempting to do here. So let me just start by saying thank you to each of you um, who uh, there would be no housing trust fund if it were not for the voters um, in the city who go to the polls every other year and support um, one of three or each of the three uh, bond packages that appear on your ballot that's the transportation bond, that's the neighborhood bonds, and that's also the housing bonds that's a, that fund the housing trust fund. Many of you are familiar that we have gone in this community for $15 million every year in terms of a housing bond to now 50 million every other year and, uh, for a housing bond. And I think that's remarkable and we're very blessed as a city. Many cities across the country cannot say that. The housing trust fund is our primary tool for creating our primary local tool for creating new and preserving existing affordable housing. We are also very fortunate to get um, federal dollars, but we, we also have this local tool. As I've already said, it's funded by you, the voters, and so we very much appreciate that. And the Housing Trust Fund is designed um, to focus on those households earning 80% and below the area median income. And you'll hear that tossed around often um, the, the way that I get my head around that is, you know, whatever, it's 80% of 100%, right, of whatever that area median income is for the year. That changes from year to year, but just based on a household of four, um, that's kind of what we base it on. Um, that's about, um, I think it's, it's this year, it's around $70,000, $71,000. Um, don't quote me on that exact figure. Um, but 80% and below. So we, we try to help those below 100% of the area median income. Wendy, if you could go to the next slide for me, please. So I always like to show what we've done and while we're talking about what we've done. So with the $50 million bond that was, um, that was approved in 2018, we financed about 3,000 units, so 2,855. People often say we don't do enough around the homeless. Um, in that 2,800 and some odd units, those 194 shelter beds, 
There are also 674 units that have been preserved. Um, we know it's not just about building new, but it's preserving the existing housing stock. And I'm also proud to support, back to our support of the homeless um, and those at 30% and below, our most vulnerable population, 27% of those funds have gone there. We also set aside $3 million. You all heard a lot about the Brook Hill redevelopment. We set aside $3 million to help um, with that development whenever it's ready to be developed. And in addition to using these funds, we don't just use them, but we also seek to leverage them with other dollars so that they can go further. And so we've leveraged over $20 million of what's called the Charlotte Housing Opportunity Investment Funds. So that was an additional $53 million raised by the public sector to match the housing trust fund. And you can see we've also gotten over 400 million of other um, financing to help get these developments done. And that's really important too, because not only are, as we're building affordable housing, we are building quality affordable housing. And so I say that to say it's built um, equal as well as the market rate developments. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. We also understand that um, we, we can't just build new, we need to preserve and in our building new, um, the city council was very clear to say that they want to also focus on for sale housing, home ownership opportunities. And so this year we're setting aside 10% of the 50 million um, for, to focus on for sale affordable home ownership. And I know that's really, really important um, along the Beatty's Ford Road corridor in many communities throughout the district too and throughout the city. We do this work by issuing uh, requests for proposals twice per year, and we are we will we are into our first round. Those applications are due in early February. We also recognize that in doing this work, we I've talked about preservation, and so we have a rolling um, request for proposals for um, naturally occurring because we want to be able to allow developers to capture those whenever they become for sale so that they are not ultimately sold for some luxury apartment or price point that 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 um, is not affordable. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. I've alluded to this, so I won't spend a lot of time here. What I would just say is that when we're doing new affordable rental, and this is again how we help um, our most vulnerable, including um, our 30% and below households, each of the units um, each of the developments that are approved through the Housing Trust Fund must have 20% of the units committed for households at that lowest end of the spectrum. These, these developments also um, must accept housing choice vouchers and other forms of rental subsidy, and they do. In terms of affordable for sale, we told you that that is new. Um, and what I would point out in this new body of work for us We've said that each of the developments must include a minimum of 20% of the homes um, for households earning 60% um, and below the area median income. We do this because we want to create diverse communities for people um, at, at different price points. And so that's what we're trying to do here. But we also are considering, um, this is in the works now, land acquisition um, for community land trusts, such as the Westside Land Trust. And Cherry will talk more about that in her work as well. If you could go to the next slide for me, please. We've talked a lot about NOAA's. The only thing I would say here is in addition to the $50 million um, that you all approved in the trust fund, um, Mr. Jones um, and the city council, they went a step above. They set aside in the last budget an additional six million dollars in a in a what we called a NOAA fund that was four million dollars for multifamily um, NOAAs and that was two million dollars for single family um, acquisition there. So that work is currently underway. And then one of the things, the newer tools that we have in our affordable housing toolbox is this notion of a rental subsidy to support. Um, NOAA properties that will allow us to serve additional households who are at that lower end of the spectrum who may not have any form of rental subsidy. So we're trying to attack it from, from many different angles. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. So we, we have the opportunity to, to build new affordable housing that is financed through our, through our trust fund. 
But what we also know is, again, the city can't do it alone and we'll never have enough money from a city perspective to build our way out of this crisis. And so in recognizing that, um, we have a program. We are not a state where we have the ability to have inclusionary housing. If you've been around this work or this conversation there's, um, for any time, there's been lots of conversations about why we do or don't have mandatory inclusionary housing. We don't. We would need state enabling legislation. But in, in the absence of that, we are um, we have had many successes through our voluntary efforts um, that come through our rezoning process. And what that means is developers are voluntarily including and committing to affordable units in their new developments. And so in 2020, through our rezonings, we achieved, um, we got 530 units committed through that rezoning process, voluntarily committed. And so that is um, really, really something um, to be um, commended and to be proud of from our um, market rate developers. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. Talk a little bit about home ownership. So that's our trust fund. The trust fund is not our only funding mechanism whereby we create affordable housing. Many of you all are familiar with what's called our House Charlotte Down Payment Assistance Program. It's been around for many years. I hope some of you all have benefited. Um, this is a product that we have where people who are eligible, meaning that they're bankable, that they qualify for a loan for a home ownership loan through a bank. They can also come to the city um, or their lender can come to the city and, and help them achieve the House Charlotte down payment assistance. That is um, additional dollars that will help them with their down payment assistance, which ultimately makes them, uh, enables them to have an affordable mortgage. You can see we did 265 of these um, loans uh, last year, and this is a for forgivable loan over a period of time. To couple with that, we have a new program that's called our Community Heroes Program. That is a partnership that we have with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta. The House Charlotte um, tool is funded from our federal housing dollars, our, our federal um, home dollars. The, the Community Heroes Program is funded through the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta, um, and we did 30 of those loans this year. Those loans, as prescribed by the Federal Home Bank of Atlanta, they, they are for our community heroes. They are for our traditional heroes and, and I'll say our non-traditional heroes. So our traditional community heroes are our police officers, our firefighters, our school teachers, um, and, and our nurses. But during the pandemic, um, you and I both realized that we have a number of community heroes, right? Like our supply chain workers. And so we expanded this. Um, the, the Federal Home Loan Bank allowed us to expand it to include some more trades. And so that's another tool that we have. You can couple that in some cases with the House Charlotte program and, and get a significant down payment assistance. I talked a little bit earlier about the NOAA for sale, and this is what that is, the acquisition, rehab, and resale. We were able through the uh, money that the, the city council and the manager put in our budget last year, $2 million, to where we have acquired 13 single family homes. We're in the process of rehabbing those homes. They will then be resold um, to eligible homeowners um, to become, to create affordable home ownership. And so we're really excited about that program. So you can see through the combination of these programs, we were able, or we're well on our way to creating um, 308 new home ownership opportunities um, here in, um, in 2020 and going into 21. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. I talked about the House Charlotte program. So again, I'm not going to rehash that, but you can see kind of just more information there on it. It's open to all households earning 110% and below the area median income. Go to the next slide for me, please. I talked about the Community Heroes program. And, it, and I do want to just highlight, I, I mentioned that we added some kind of non-traditional heroes here recently. And so we added um, social workers, we added case workers and, and counselors, we added our um, grocery and pharmacy workers, we, we added child care workers, and we um, added our supply chain workers, um, those who work at UPS, FedEx, Amazon, and the likes. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. 
I talked a little bit about the acquisition rehab um, resale program. Just to reiterate, we've we've purchased all 13 homes and we are well under way with our um, with our rehab activity. One of those units have been um, completed and sold. If you go to the next slide for me, please. Talked about our rehab and many of you all are familiar with our rehab program. Um, we, we do this in a number of ways. One thing that I highlight is, um, so we have our safe home rehab program. That's kind of been traditional. What we see, I like to tell people that was kind of our first, our early entry into helping seniors, particularly age in place. And what I mean by that is, you know, what we see a lot of is bathrooms going in, upfitting bathrooms, adding grab bars for people so that um, they can be safe in their homes, looking at roofing and other deferred maintenance. We started several years ago, um, TLC by CLT. That's where we recognized that it was good to do our safe home program. And, and I like to call those kind of one-offs, right? But if we really, really want to change neighborhoods and create vibrant communities, we really needed to go in and do wholesale um, revitalization. And so we started this work in two areas in West Charlotte. We started it in the historic Camp Green neighborhood, and we also started it in LaSalle. And so many of the homes on LaSalle Street have been re re um, received rehab through this program. We have our Lead Safe program where we go in and we abate the lead, if there's lead found in older homes. And we try to do this work in concert so that we're really not disturbing the property owner, um, but one time we wanna minimize the disturbances in their home. We have our emergency repair program. Um, those, are, those are repairs that need to be made right away. Like if someone is dealing with um, you know, a, heat, a heat issue in the winter, uh, we certainly wanna go in and make those repairs right away. And then we work with partners like Habitat um, to do um, other critical home repairs. So you can see in 2020, we did about 125 homes through a combination of those programs. If you go to the next slide for me, please. So I'm gonna just go ahead and have Wendy fast forward. What I would lift up to about the Safe Home Rehabilitation Program is that Lowe's um, noticed the work they wanted to get into um, kind of the affordable housing arena. And so we had some conversations through some relationships with them and they made a $1 million grant that we're starting to um, de deploy. Um, they said they wanted to be on the Beatty's Ford Road Quarter. And I think one of the reasons that they decided to be on the Beatty's Ford Road Quarter is because they saw the work that the city was embarking on through our quarters of opportunity that um, Cherry will talk about um, later on this evening. But that's another resource that is coming uh, to, to specifically um, to the west side, to the Beatty's Fort Road quarter. And that was that was low stipulation, not the city stipulation. So we have to abide by that. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. I talked about the CLT, the TLC by CLT. I mentioned that we started in, in Camp Green and in Lincoln Heights. I said LaSalle Street, but Lincoln Heights um, along, along LaSalle Street. We're moving now to Revolution Park and to the Washington Heights community. Um, so again, with more funding, we can do other neighborhoods um, in, in the coming years. You can see since 2016, we've done 77 homes there. Um, it's, we've, we've invested about 3.7 in rehab efforts of those homes. Again, this program helps people age in place. If you go to the next slide for me, please. Talk a little bit about supporting the land trust. Um, we, um, and, and I think the city council um, many of the city council members agreed, we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. We just needed to support an up and coming land trust in our city, the West Side Land Trust. And so you can see here, we're doing lots of work to support and build capacity in the West Side Land Trust. What I will highlight is that they have an exciting project underway in the Lakewood community um, where they are, have partnered with um, the Little Rock CDC and I think it's the Afro-American Cultural Center where they move what many Charlatans might refer to as the two shotgun townhomes that used to sit there behind the Little Rock AME Zion Church. Um, we've, part, we've partnered, those homes have been moved to um, a, a plot of land in Lakewood and they are being rehabbed and they will become affordable units. So that's a very, very unique opportunity. If you go to the next slide for me, 
um, emergency solutions grant. Again, the city has never, ever forgotten about the homeless population. While we're not the lead agency, we have for many years partnered with our, the county and our other partners to, to, to look after our homeless population. You can see here um, kind of the outcome. We assisted over 6,000 people in 2020. I mean, that was really, really important with the um, pandemic um, that, was, that was in front of us. And so that work is really important and we're think, thinking about innovative ways to continue that work. If you go to the next slide for me, please. Housing for persons with AIDS and HIV. Again, this is done through our federal HOPEWA dollars. And so we um, provide, we work with Carolina's Care Partnership. And you can see in 2020, we assisted um, over 500 individuals there. If you go to the next slide for me, um, this is kind of what we have, what, what we did with our CARES Act, our money that we got from the federal government um, as a result of the pandemic. Lots of great work done there. Uh, Mr. Graham led the um, Housing Opportunity Task Force, I believe it was called this summer, where, the, where a group of um, city staff and community partners met um, over, I think it was about a 14 week period to really think about how we adequately use these dollars um, in the community to, to help combat the pandemic. If you go to the next slide for me, please. More on about how we used our CARES Act dollars there. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that we continue to work with our partners who support our homeless population. We provided rental assistance that was very important to help people stay in their homes. We also provided mortgage and utility assistance as well. If you go to the next slide for me, please. Um, more about how we've done it in the homeless um, arena. We've, we've provided a ton of money there. Um, and we know we recognize that more needs to be done. If you go to the next slide for me, please. I'll stop here and not to steal any of Cherry's thunder. I would just say um, in doing this work, the quarters of opportunity framework, it's not just about housing, but it, it allows um, other directors, to um, my colleagues to sit in a room on a regular basis and think about how we're deploying the collect city's collective resources to improve um, areas throughout our community. If you'll go to the next slide for me, please. I always like to show people kind of what's on the ground. And so this map is really a depiction of where um, you can find housing trust fund development, House Charlotte assistance, um, our community heroes assistance, the rehab work, um, that we have done in our acquisition um, resale and rehab along the base Ford Road corridor. Um, and so I think it's really important to kind of show proximity there. If you'll go to the next slide for me. And this is what where I'll end with. Well, you hear the term gentrification a lot in the city and it's very real. Um, it's, more, it's, it, it's, it's more exacerbated in some parts of the city um, than others. And so what I always like to leave people with is all while there is no perfect solution to combat gentrification throughout the country, if you look, but what I would say is that um, all of our housing programs, and I would submit to you that um, are working together to combat and address gentrification. Housing is not the silver bullet though. Housing is intrinsically linked to other um, social and economic issues such as we have to have quality infrastructure, we have to have good paying jobs, we have to engage people in workforce development, and we have to engage people in educational opportunities. All of this works to combat gentrification and to achieve upwardly economic mobility. And so with that, I will pause and again, thank you for allowing me to be here and I hope I didn't go over my time too much. Thank you, Ms. Wyden. And, uh, we have two quick questions for you before we let you leave, um, leave the stage. One was from a constituent who was actually in reference to making sure that affordable housing is spread throughout the community, specifically in South Charlotte, the Ballantyne area. Can you talk a little bit about what we're doing to make sure that there's affordable housing throughout the community? Yes, um, so that is, that is a long-standing discussion in this community. Um, and so what I would point to, Mr. Graham, and I don't know if you want to say more about this, I believe, and correct me if I misspeak, just this past Monday night, I believe it was, on your zoning agenda or recent zoning agenda, I think you guys had a public hearing on 
um, a development that is going to be in Valentine, um, that's going through the rezoning process now, that development, the number escapes me, but it has a number of um, committed affordable housing developments in that development in Ballantyne. So I, the, the other thing that I will point to in terms of um, spreading it throughout the community and, and hats off to the city council, um, the, the city has begun um, and, and has some, some examples of where um, the city is committed to using city owned land um, to help write down the cost of affordable housing to allow it to be spread in, in, in more affluent areas through throughout the city of Charlotte. Um, two of those to note is the Scaly Bark um, along the, the blue line, which is very important. We talked about the cost of transportation and housing. And then another one is in the Cherry community um, where um, city on land is used there and there are 30 um, deeply affordable units there. And then I'll just highlight the Little Rock um, AME Zion Church. That was a portion of church on land and city on land where you're going to see some truly affordable developments there in areas of high opportunity. So we're not perfect yet, but um, the city council also recognizes this need and is working to accomplish that. Last question, and, and you simply, simply cannot answer this question quickly, but if you can do it in, in 60 seconds for me. Uh, a lot of um, questions about homelessness in Charlotte. So could you talk about the relationship between the, the city and the county and who's the lead agency and, and what our role is you talked about in your presentation before, before 60 seconds? Could you kind of just kind of wrap that up for us? Sure, 60 second answer. So the city primarily is bricks and sticks, building the facilities and the county is um, health and human services, dealing with the mental health and the substance abuse issues that many homeless people say, I mean, face. Hopefully that, that helps. Well, that helped, and I just refer everyone who's listening to an editorial that I wrote that was published in the Charlotte Observer this Monday entitled, What Should Charlotte Do About Its Homeless Tent City? If you can refer to that, um, read it, um, send me your, your questions um, or your feedback to it at uh, malcolm.gram at charlottenc.gov, malcolm.gram at charlottenc.gov, or just put your questions in the chat and then we will get to you, uh, send your response from my office relating to those questions. Ms. Wyman, thank you very much for, for being with us tonight. Um, as you can see, the city is doing a whole lot relating to housing, affordable housing uh, uh, um, specifically. Uh, and again, uh, in the final comments, uh, as we wrap up tonight, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Tent City uh, and from my perspective as a single council member, not for the council or the mayor at all, but for, from my perspective, Malcolm Graham. Thank you, Ms. Wyman. Thank you, Mr. Graham, for having me. And I look forward to, um, to continuing to work with you and hear from the community. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is a gentleman that um, I, I really admire uh, because uh, he and the, the men and women that he represents uh, is responsible for keeping us safe. Um, he has, and he heard me say this before, he has one of the only jobs that you get evaluated every day. Uh, and that's a high bar to clear, but he and his police department has done it. Uh, last year was a really interesting year for our community, specifically and throughout the nation relating to to George Floyd and what happened there and the way our community responded, um, the way our, our police department was challenged and responded. I have an enormous amount of respect for him. Uh, he's been on the job now, I think Chief Jennings for about six months, seven months, uh, and he's representing our community extremely well. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, for a District 2 crime update, um, the Chief of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department uh, Chief Johnny Jennings. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, uh, Council Member Graham. I, it's, I certainly appreciate your leadership and uh, just uh, we've had some interesting conversations as well throughout the past several months. And I just want to uh, basically I have a few slides to go through and go go over a couple of things uh, that uh, want to give you the, the view of our jurisdiction uh, throughout CMPD as a whole, just an overview from last year and then some specific uh, things as far as District 2 is concerned. So we can go to the next slide. 
And the next slide, we'll, 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 we can go to the next one as well. So uh, this is just an overview that uh, I presented uh, to City Council Monday. This is uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, Police Jurisdiction. Uh, so it gives you kind of an idea of, of uh, some of the calls for service and, and some of the crime trends that we had to uh, deal with specifically last year. Uh, a couple of things just of note is uh, uh, you look at the uh, violent crime arrests. We look at total arrests of 14,568, which is down. Uh, the violent crime arrest, however, has actually gone up uh, at 3,050. It's up from last year or from the prior year. Uh, and, and that kind of goes along with my goals that we want to put a majority focus on the violent crime, those crimes that are preying on the community uh, and what we can do to be able to affect that, which is, you know, again, it, it, it's not, it's naive to think that, that the police department is going to uh, tackle this by ourselves, but uh, as we've seen, the city and the county and the leadership uh, with our public officials have stepped in and said, this is not just a police problem. It's something that we all share. Uh, and I certainly appreciate that from my perspective. Uh, and then also as far as uh, guns that we've been able to take off the street, 2,265 guns uh, that we've taken off the streets, which is also up from 2019. Uh, so uh, very proud of the work that uh, our men and women in blue have been uh, doing out on the streets uh, and trying to keep you all safe uh, and, and keep the, the community safe as well. So uh, we look at the disturbing part of what we saw last year is an 18% uh, increase in our homicides. Uh, and I'll get into that in specific to District 2 as well, but uh, and also a 16% increase in violent crime. And violent crime, meaning your robberies, assaults, uh, anything that of a violent nature that we report, uh, that we get reports on as well. So uh, some of the things that are obvious throughout the uh, community uh, with the uh, with the effects of COVID-19 and the quarantines and uh, and uh, some of the lockdown orders that you've seen that we have actually had a decrease in property crimes uh, and um, a lot of the property crimes. Uh, dealing with like residential burglaries. Burglaries are actually down 31% for the city. Uh, and, and a lot of that is you take away one of the factors that is needed to commit a criminal act, and that's the opportunity. And you take that opportunity away with people being at home more, uh, then those crimes are gonna uh, obviously go down. So we've, we've seen the benefits of that with the 31% decrease. However, it is uh, disturbing to see the homicide and violent crime rates that that uh, we've had some challenges with. All right, so if I go to the next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a quick slide I wanted to throw in because we had historic numbers for our Crime Stoppers tips. Despite uh, all the challenges of 2020 with COVID, uh, we had a record number of tips coming in. Uh, and the interesting thing about the tips, and you can read the numbers as far as the 162 arrests and everything else, but what I wanna uh, kind of point out about the tips even though Crime Stoppers is, a, is something that provides monetary uh, rewards for information that leads to these arrests, we have a great deal of, of, of our community that will issue, give us Crime Stoppers tips that leads to arrest, uh, and then we don't hear from them again. When they, don't, they don't call back, they don't care about the money, the reward, they just wanna make sure that they're doing their part in keeping the community safe. And that's a huge plus for us uh, when we see that, that uh, the community cares and, and is giving that information to us. So we go to the next slide. Uh, next, I'll talk about uh, specific to District 2, just a few things, and we'll go into that. Uh, and I'm, I hope I don't have to put my glasses on to see that because that's small. <laughs> All right, so I'll give a quick uh, overview. D District 2 uh, is you look at specifically with the homicide rate, and you saw where. Uh, we had a 18% a, a increase for the city. District 2 saw a 35% increase in homicides last year. Uh, now that number, the difference between those numbers is 20, is, is basically seven. Uh, and, but if you also look at the, you know, the ominous events of June 22nd, where we saw on Betty Ford Road, uh, uh, there were four people who were victims of homicides. Uh, and that number, obviously does not help when we start looking at uh, overall crime within uh, District 2 as well. 
so one positive uh, that we can look at as far as District 2 is concerned is the robberies. Uh, robbery considered a violent crime, which was up, uh, violent crime being up total within the city. Uh, robberies were down total within the city, but District 2 also saw robberies down 2.3%, uh, uh, which I can uh, uh, relate if we can keep that trend going uh, and, and keep that as far as a, in a positive note. So the other things that correlate with the city, the aggravated assaults fifth, up 15.1%. Uh, that you see on there, and we've seen that across the city. But most disturbing uh, is the aggravated assaults with guns. 33.9% uh, of our assaults involve firearms. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the things that I know that we're pushing hard within our agency to make sure that uh, we are uh, not just targeting the right people. We're doing a lot of things that, that we want to get the people uh, that are committing these crimes that have guns on them. Uh, so we're, we're working really hard with a lot of our different units to ensure that happens. And then, uh, again, residential burglaries, uh, as I talked about, citywide is, it, it, within District 2 is down uh, 2%, and that's also a testament to a lot more people being home and taking away that opportunity. All right, next slide, please. So, Betty's Ford World Area, what I wanted to do is take, uh, the, I'd be here all day to talk about all the divisions uh, the District 2 is comprised of, of three divisions. You hit Metro Division, North Division, and just a little bit of Freedom Division. Uh, so I wanted to pick one example of kind of what we've done uh, in Betty's Ford Road, uh, to me, is one of the better examples that I can talk about. So Betty, Betty's Ford Road is a primary focus for the Metro Division, uh, and they've been doing a great deal of work. I remember actually being out, out there with uh, uh, Councilman Graham uh, when we unveiled uh, a lot of different, uh, a lot of the things that we're wanting to do in that uh, area, uh, particularly the corridors of opportunity as well, that uh, we, I, I made a promise then that I want to make sure that we're showing that officers are out walking beats, bike patrols, some of the non-traditional patrols, and also to make themselves more available uh, to the community. It's still early. Uh, it's only been uh, uh, months and not years, but uh, I think our officers are uh, are getting that message that that's what their expectation is. Uh, and if you look, we also have a way of tracking what they're doing as far as community outreach and things that they're uh, getting involved in with community engagement. So we've had more than 90 conducted since October 1, 90 uh, of these initiatives that have been non-traditional. Uh, and more than 350 officers have participated in that. So not just your division officers are working uh, in these areas. It's also other officers that specialized units uh, that are doing some of the work as well. And one of the things I heard as well out there was the uh, traffic. Uh, they, they wanted to see more of us enforcing more on the speeding uh, and some of the reckless driving. So that kind of goes with us. When I talk about community collaboration is we want to hear from the community on how you want to be policed in, the, in your neighborhoods. So we want to have a tailored response uh, on how CMPD moves forward and, and, uh, and, and polices the neighborhood. So with that, uh, officers have made over 400 traffic stops. That's just since July 1st. Uh, and they've wrote, written 88 citations, uh, 13 arrests out of those stops, and uh, 330 warnings. And, and to me, that's significant because I talk all the time, when we talk about over-policing in neighborhoods, I, I think we re what we really mean is over enforcement. And, uh, you know, we, we want to look at different ways uh, to make people more productive in the community. Sometimes people need that second chance, and sometimes they need that push from us that how do we help them uh, become productive citizens within the community, whether that's getting them, helping them with uh, uh, job opportunities, training opportunities, um, just things that we can do before they get caught up too much in the criminal justice system. Next slide, please. And so uh, still on Beatty's Ford Road, we, we, were, we were fortunate to have federal funds that allow us to, to provide overtime to officers. We've uh, allocated a lot of that, those resources into the Beatty's Ford Road, Roswell's, Roswell's Ferry Road area. Uh, and 1,200 hours of uh, overtime has been a uh, focus for our officers since July. Uh, which has allowed us to do some of this high visibility 
and non-traditional um, approaches towards our patrols uh, and also drug operations and, and, and uh, operations associated with uh, violent crime. And then the technology as well. So we've worked with a lot of businesses in the community, particularly on this corridor, uh, that we've helped them get uh, in place surveillance cameras where uh, they can actually have better security around their businesses. Uh, and also we're working with them to uh, allow us to have the access to those cameras and how they can have best practices, where, to, where the cameras should be focused and how they can uh, uh, make sure that if a crime occurs on their property, that those cameras are in the best locations that we can capture that. Uh, and, and then again, the, uh, you've heard a lot of talk about uh, homelessness and uh, mental health. Uh, we're a partner in that as well. Uh, CMPD wants to make sure that, uh, that we're doing our part uh, to make sure that uh, one, that we provide resources and, and, and direct resources uh, towards the homeless camps and the homelessness, uh, and also our crime prevention, uh, our community policing, uh, crisis response team, which is CPCRT, uh, that we use to help address mental health uh, issues. So next slide. Uh, again, uh, uh, staying on the Betty's Ford Road corridor, Metro Division uh, has some ongoing drug operations. A lot of times this is kind of difficult to, uh, to go out and tell the community what we're doing because a lot of the drug operations uh, must kind of have to remain uh, low key uh, because of their long-term investigation. So uh, I, what I can assure you now is that there are some drug investigations that we are conducting on the, on the corridor. Uh, and we hope that long-term that that's gonna help clean, uh, help clean that area up and, and move it forward as well. So next slide. So moving forward in 2021, we can move forward. So uh, I've, I've instructed all of the divisions and not just uh, through di the divisions in district two uh, is I want to get a, a violent crime reduction strategy uh, that I want them to make sure that uh, it's specific to the neighborhoods that they're serving. So uh, they have already begun this process. Uh, the three areas that they're focusing on are the priority locations, priority offenders and priority partnerships. Uh, and, and there's gonna be more to that to come, but, but that's, that's exciting to me that you know, I have my vision of what I wanna make sure that we're, attack, we're attacking out uh, with the violent crime. Uh, and I've tasked them to get ownership into this uh, as well as the community having ownership in it as well. So next slide. And that's it for me and uh, in my presentation. I, I know it was kind of short and uh, but we have a great deal of good work that our men are doing, men and women are doing in, within our agency. So, well, Chief, I thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and exactly what we needed. There's about three questions that came in that, that for you, and if you can help us answer. One, um, you, you mentioned that you want to hear from the community on how they want to be policed in their neighborhoods. Yes. What is the best way to share that feedback? I said, first of all, and, and I'm glad you, that question was asked because I meant to actually cover uh, in the presentation that the, the biggest thing that I can tell people in the community is get to know your officers, uh, get to know them by first name, get to know the division captains, because what we are doing, those division captains are the ones that are driving a lot of this work within the divisions. Uh, and also we... Uh, we have just had one today with, with uh, we, we've already done the Metro. We, we have what's called a core stat. Uh, and what the plan is, unfortunately, COVID is kind of restricting how many people, but we're inviting community members uh, to our division report outs. Uh, and it shows you how, to, how do we keep our division captains accountable for uh, addressing it, issues within those divisions, as well as being inclusive of my core four uh, and one being community collaboration. So, uh, so we're going to be putting that out on the table, uh, expecting that to happen. But the, the easiest answer to that is get to know the community officers and get to know the division captains. Another question, I think you've already answered in your presentation, but I'll answer again. Uh, any new developments on the Juneteenth shootings? Yeah, so uh, again, that's one of those let me just say that we're making, we have made a great deal of progress that we can't necessarily always share at this point, but 
Uh, I know early on that we had a lot of difficulty in getting information. A lot of the community really stepped up and started giving information to us that was helping us corroborate some of the some of the uh, information we developed through the investigation. You know, however, it's very difficult to get firsthand knowledge that we can actually take to the district attorney uh, and say this is um, uh, this is this is how how we can develop probable cause on an individual. But it's not just CMPD working on this. Uh, it's not. It hasn't stopped being worked on. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, there's been progress made. It's just a matter of us having to, to be able to uh, develop that probable cause to make those arrests. And, and last question, then we'll let you uh, run off. Um, th there's been a, a dramatic increase in gun purchase in Mecklenburg County. Um, what is CMPD doing to make sure new gun owners are properly securing uh, their firearms? Yeah, great question. And that, that is, and you saw the amount of firearms were taken off the street. So even legal purchases of guns, they still... Uh, we still have them getting stolen and, 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 and being used in criminal activity. So uh, what we, if, if everyone remembers, we had a, a string of young, young kids that were accidentally uh, firing weapons and getting injured and, and if not killed. Uh, and so we, we made a really big push for uh, gun security and, and pushing out the gun locks and, uh, and, and gun education within the community. But you know, it, it takes more than us to be able to do that. It, it takes the entire community that if someone's going to own a gun, they have to be responsible with that firearm. Uh, and that's why they, they put laws on the books that, that, that ensure that you're securing those away from uh, uh, young kids that can get a hold of them and, and think that they're toys. But uh, we have to continue pushing the gun safety out and, and providing devices that can help uh, uh, secure those weapons. Uh, Chief Jennings, you are off the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, please send my regards to all the men and women in uniform. You guys stay safe and, and God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Take care. Now, this is, I'm really excited about this portion of the agenda because it's where I, I kind of spend the most work over the last year, and that's um, in transportation, the, the, uh, the streetcar. Uh, and the uh, quarters of opportunity. And so next is the, the CEO of, of CATS, John Lewis. Uh, he's been a very busy man for the last several years getting this project um, up and running and it is fastly coming to an end. And so I just want to bring John up. Thank you, John, for your leadership. He's going to discuss the phase two project update. Uh, and John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Councilman, and it's a pleasure being with you and your constituents in District 2 this evening. I'm really excited about the opportunity to uh, update uh, everyone on the progress of the Gold Line Phase 2, but also before we get into that, I'm going to take a uh, bird's eye look of the entire uh, CATS 2030 plan. As the manager mentioned uh, earlier on, we are in the last five years since I've taken the, had the opportunity to take the helm of the Charlotte area transit system. We've been in the midst of an incredible uh, growth uh, period. The South Corridor of the Blue Line opened in 2007, but just in the last several years, uh, we have opened in 2015 phase one of the Gold Line, which connected the downtown transit center to uh, Novant Hospital. In 2018, March of 2018, we opened nine and a half miles on, of the extension of the blue line from the transit center from 7th Street in Uptown to University of North Carolina at Charlotte uh, campus. Uh, that project was on time and on budget, believe it or not. Uh, and then right after that, we embarked on the uh, construction of phase two of the gold line. That project has taken a little longer than, than we imagined, but we're excited to be at the goal line right now. Uh, we're at the very end of this project, and I'm happy to give you an update on where we are tonight. And then talk about the other projects, the entering into phase three of the goal line, which will connect from Sunnyside Avenue out to Eastland Mall, and then on the west end from French Street to Rosa Parks. 
This is the conversation the community is, is having right now, led by uh, Mayor Lyles and our city council about finding the necessary resources and to enable us to build out the rest of this plan. Next slide. And so uh, ending in 2020, uh, this project, the phase two of the gold line uh, was really on a, on a good uh, pathway. We caught up on, on some of the areas like the Hawthorne Bridge that uh, caused so much of the uh, significant amount of the delay in this project, but that construction has ended. Uh, the traction power systems, the overhead catenaries were um, uh, installed throughout the vast majority of the project, and we're looking into a very positive 2021 moving forward. Next slide. January, February of this year, the contractor will be finishing up uh, the construction activities. Uh, lighting installation is happening now, the, the finishing up the platforms uh, where our customers will be able to be able to board and alight from the streetcar. Uh, the shelters are coming up. Uh, testing of the overhead wire continues. And uh, right now they're finishing up some of the punch I uh, list items such as sidewalk fencing, cleaning up the corridor, which is so very important, and finishing the retaining walls near French Street. Next slide. And then uh, you can look at into February and March, uh, again, more of the pedestrian lighting to be complete, traffic signals uh, will be completed, and then you'll start to see some of our vehicles in the street. Uh, next slide. So the next phase for testing, once the contractor turns over the corridor, uh, the contractor will be completing uh, his standalone testing to ensure that the construction that they've done are meeting our contractual standards. Uh, and we believe that will take place throughout February. Uh, by the mid to late February, they will turn the corridor over to CATS and we will begin our integrated testing. This is the safety testing of the alignment. Uh, we want to make sure that the contractor has done what they said they're gonna do, has uh, turned over a corridor that has been built to our specifications, and then we will begin testing the vehicles and the uh, track and power systems and communication systems along the alignment. Uh, by mid to late February, you'll start seeing trains on the corridor. Next slide. And so what does that look like? Number one, we're very happy to announce that we will be moving to a modern streetcar. So some of the old style, as my daughters call it, the uh, San Francisco Rice Aroni uh, streetcars, we're transitioning away from them to modern streetcar. So the vehicles that you will see on the corridor will look just like the blue line vehicles, except for one major difference. These are hybrid vehicles. And so as these uh, vehicles are coming west along the alignment, uh, when they leave the Charlotte Transit Center and head through uh, Trade and Tryon and Uptown, the wires, the Cantonary will come down. Uh, we will go off wire and operate on battery power for these vehicles. And that will continue almost all the way uh, to uh, the um, location of the um, of the Charlotte Gateway Center, we will be off wire. Uh, and so we're excited about this hybrid technology. The vehicles will look just like uh, the uh, modern uh, streetcar, will look just like the light rail vehicles that are in operation today. Next slide. So as we continue to uh, close out our safety and operations testing, at the same time, we'll be embarking on an, a, a, a very a comprehensive education system. This is a new technology that will be coming through the community. A uh, streetcar operates in the uh, flow of traffic. So we wanna make sure people understand uh, the operations of the system, what they can do in terms of driving cars and, and walking and biking along the corridor. We really want to highlight safe uh, activities around these vehicles. Trains do not stop on a dime. And so we all have to work together to ensure that uh, there, there aren't any mishaps as we uh, open this next phase of the streetcar. 
Next slide. And so I talked a little bit about the uh, modern streetcar. You just see real, real uh, closely in, in this uh, frame what they will look like. Again, they're hybrid. They will able to go off wire and operate on battery for a good portion of their trip. Next slide. I'm also very excited about the artwork that will be installed in each of the stations. We, uh, at the beginning of this uh, project, we brought on three fantastic artists and they went out and developed incredible artwork uh, in the West End. Uh, the artist is George Bates. In Uptown is Sonia Ishii and Jim Hirschfield. And in the Elizabeth community, it's Amy Chang. And you'll see towards uh, just during the uh, safety testing as the glass in our shelters will begin to be installed. You'll see the incredible artwork that these artists have come up with. And we really hope that this will add uh, value to the community in terms, not just in terms of the mobility options, but really how our stations fit into the community and add uh, additional value to the community through this artwork. Next slide. Operations is important to understand it will operate just like uh, the light rail line, the blue line, uh, we will begin collecting fares uh, and the operations will be the same uh, uh, frequency and service levels as, as operated on the light rail. So during the weekdays, 15 minute intervals on peak, uh, 15 to 20 minutes on off peak as we get into the evening and late night. And then on Saturday, daytime, it'll be 15 minute frequency and at nighttime, 20 minutes. And then on Sunday, it'll be 20 minutes service during the daytime and 30 minutes in the evening. Next slide. And then once we, uh, like we did with phase one and phase two, we're excited about not only the operation and opening of phase two, but we're also excited about getting uh, busy with the design and engineering of phase three. As I mentioned earlier, phase three will start at French Street where we ended off on phase two, uh, and then uh, head out through Rosa Parks and on the West End. On the East End, it will start at Sunnyside Avenue and can continue out to Eastland um, Mall. So we're ex not stopping uh, our work on this. We will be excited about the operations of phase two that really begins to connect, provide connectivity between the, the neighborhoods of the historic West End through Uptown Charlotte and then out to the neighborhoods of the East End. And then we get back to work designing phase three. Next slide. If there are any questions about that, please uh, look at our website, ridetransit.org, uh, through our City Links Twitter account or our City Links Goldline Facebook to, uh, account to uh, offer any opinions, have any answer any questions, or provide any comments. Councilman Graham, that includes my, concludes my presentation this evening. I'd be glad to answer any questions. John, that's an exciting presentation. And I remember when I was an employee at Johnson C. Smith University uh, and the first streetcar task force meeting was held on campus. Uh, and it was a dream. And to think that uh, within 45, 60 days that we'll be riding a train, the practice runs. and seen it up and down the corridor, um, it's extremely exciting. Uh, and the fact that we are already doing some forward thinking about phase three, and that was one of the questions in terms of the funds and the planning and the resource available for, for phase three is really exciting. So can you talk to us a little bit more about where we stand in terms of the funding and the planning for, for phase three? That's two or three questions about that already. Sure. And so uh, thank you for those, those questions. Um, you know, as a transit provider, I, I love the opportunities to open new mobility options. And Charlotte is way ahead of the curve in terms of uh, our competitors and our neighbors in the southeast uh, with the amount of fixed rail uh, investments we're making. Um, but as, as everything, the cost of these investments continue to rise and has gone beyond our ability to fund with the current half cent sales tax. And so this is happening at the right time uh, through the leadership, as I mentioned earlier, of our city council and our elected officials and Mayor Lyles. We are having that conversation now about the opportunity 
to uh, fund future investments. And so uh, that has been quite a debate thus far. I think it will continue to be over the coming months. But uh, Charlotte, I believe that transit is embedded in the DNA of Charlotte. Uh, since 2002, 2007, excuse me, with the opening of the South Corridor Blue Line, we have consistently continued to move forward with this type of uh, investment from a mobility standpoint, but also how it uh, supports economic development, supports job creation, and also brings our community together. And so I'm very positive about the uh, prospects of bringing that next level of investment to Charlotte. I, and I, you can count on me as being an advocate um, for phase three and, and getting that line um, planned and funded and uh, as a priority for our community. I think that's really important that we continue to, to um, progressively plan and, and move forward. A, a question that people are asking is about the, the lane reduction uh, on Bainesville Road based on the streetcar from four lanes to two. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of traffic patterns and what that, what's that's going to look like once the, the trains start running? Sure. So I, I think one of the things that we're looking at uh, comprehensively with our partners, both in the planning department and transportation, is how do we transition in, away from that old philosophy of how we move cars to how we move people? And so I, I like to think of it from a geometry standpoint. One streetcar, which is about the size of three uh, individual vehicles, carries upwards of 60 people. And so as we are making this investment, and yes, we're uh, in, in this rail corridor is within uh, the street, and some areas we're taking away or, or narrowing the right of way for cars, but we're finding ways to move more people more efficiently through the corridor. Uh, it's a different type of technology. Light rail operates in its own corridor. Uh, streetcar operates in the same traffic as uh, our bicycles, pedestrians, and, and uh, cars are. And so we have to learn to work together in that corridor. That's why we will be out with a, a very aggressive education uh, position. But I think as we've seen with phase one of the streetcar, that streetcar and uh, single occupant vehicles and bikes and pedestrians and scooters can coexist in the same corridors. We've operated very safely over the last uh, four years of, of um, uh, phase one of the streetcar, and I'm confident that we will continue uh, with that same record for phase two. The last question, then we'll let you leave on this one. Um, Again, you've answered it already, but I just want to make sure that the viewers um, get the appropriate answer because we're getting this question over again. Um, how long will testing of the goal line last and when will riders might be able to use it? That's a great question. So it's very similar, exactly the same process that we took when we opened the blue line extension. Uh, and by law, by federal law, I ha we have to test the vehicles and the corridor for 90 days without incident. Now, that's not 90 calendar days. It is um, 90 um, revenue service days. And so I can get multiple days and vehicles in one calendar day. But we do have to operate without incident. And, and incident mean without any major flaws. And so if we found out, by example, that the uh, power system uh, didn't work for some reason, we would come back, we would make those adjustments, fix that, and then start the clock again um, from where we left off. And so I, I am confident uh, when the contractor turns it over, they will turn over a functioning system. We will begin uh, our uh, in-service testing. And I think we will have revenue service in that late April to May timeframe. John, you're off the hot seat. Uh, I really appreciate your participation um, tonight. I'm so excited about uh, what's about to happen as it relates to transportation on the corridor, um, the future for, for phase three. Uh, and I look forward to um, uh, getting on that train as soon as possible. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you so much for your, your steadfast leadership. Um, we're looking forward to a fun time to be in Charlotte right now from a transportation standpoint.
Thank you, John. Last but not least, we say the best for last because this is something that I'm really, really passionate about. It's something that I really kind of uh, staked my first term on uh, doing and uh, and working with the manager and, and Tracy and Sherry and, and others. Uh, I've been a pain in the butt, they told me from time to time. But I think what we're doing on the quarter um, and identifying the opportunities there are tremendous. And here's a young lady that's on the ground, actually doing the work, um, doing it very well. And so I'm happy to bring uh, to the stage Sherry Smith, who will talk about the quarters of opportunities and all the amazing things that are about to happen along Bayless Fort Road Corridor from I-77 all the way to Bayless Fort Road and LaSalle Street and tell you about the opportunities. So I, I want to stop, right? I'm, I'm getting so excited. So Sherry, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Graham, for having me this evening. And I would like to say good evening to District 2. Uh, my name is Cherry, as you've probably heard a couple of times, and I'm the project manager for the City's Quarters of Opportunity Program. Uh, so as you heard, in July of 2020, City Council allocated $24.5 million to invest in six areas of Charlotte, uh, which we're calling our Corridors of Opportunity. One of those corridors is Beatty's Fort Road. Uh, so with careful consideration of comments and feedback uh, provided during previous engagement effort, efforts within the corridor, we were able to identify some common themes and goals that were important to the community, uh, such as improving connectivity, uh, providing high quality public spaces, providing opportunities for upward mobility, and bringing, building community leadership capacity. So with all of those goals in mind, we worked to develop a strategy that would help to catalyze transformative change by concentrating our efforts at key areas along the corridor. Uh, so with this program, we're doing things a little bit different. You may have heard uh, in everyone's presentation tonight, at some point they've mentioned corridors of opportunity. And that's the first piece to the puzzle. We're collaborating across departments within the city and we're starting to leverage our existing programs to address needs and really funnel uh, those programs and those initiatives to these specific geographic areas. And where we don't have tools or programs that are currently available, we make new ones so that we can start to see impact faster within our corridors of opportunity. So in six short months, we've identified implementable, implementable projects, programs, and initiatives that touch economic development, planning, housing, transportation, um, and infrastructure, safety, and community development with a total commitment that exceeds $10 million. And that's just for Babies for Corridor. So, um, some of those projects, just to whet your appetite a little bit, uh, include improving the intersection at LaSalle Street, um, improving sidewalks. If you've ever taken a walk down Beatty's Ford, you'll know that we can do some work there, activating our public spaces through placemaking and supporting local developers to bring high quality retail and office space to the corridor. Uh, so I don't have a presentation tonight and that was intentional because I would like to personally invite everyone that's watching uh, to an update meeting that we will have specific to the corridors of opportunity for Betty's Ford Road, where we can give you more details about the projects, the infrastructure projects, and the different community development projects that we have, the placemaking workshop that we have uh, that will kick off, that will um, afford a public take place next Thursday. February the 4th at 6.30. It'll be similar format to this. You'll be able to tune in uh, on the city's Facebook page or the city's YouTube page. You'll be able to ask questions and you'll also be able to hear from all of the different project areas and start to see how we're weaving these things together to ensure that we're seeing great impacts in our corridor. I, I, I'm glad you don't have a presentation because I, I, I wanna have a conversation with you. So let's take a walk, right? Let's start at the at Bojangles on, on West Trade Street. Talk a little bit about the I-77 project. All right, so the I-77 project, uh, if you'll know, the West Trade Russell's Ferry CNIP was passed some years ago. And that CNIP is what kickstarted the investment on the West Side from the very beginning, right? Uh, so the CNIP project is taking care of that I-77 underpass, as well as um, some of the improvements that are taking place at the West Trade intersection, five points right there. At, good old Johnson C. Smith University. 
Um, so we see a complement there with the corridors of opportunity with our five point center development, which is Sankofa. And they are bringing in um, black owned businesses that will have a pizza parlor, an ice cream shop. Uh, we also have the five points Plaza Park, which really starts to tell the story of public space for the city. So let's talk, we're gonna talk about the park next week as well, right? Uh, and so the park is planning to be opening sometime uh, probably this spring. Yes. And so that's great. Um, the I-77 corridor bridge is gonna have some artwork to complement passing through life. That's gonna mm -hmm. be around the same time frame, April. So that's exciting. Uh, and John just talked about the streetcar running within that same time frame. So a lot's about to happen within the next 30 to 45 days. Exactly. And then it won't stop there, right? Because if you continue, if we're taking this journey up Beatty's Ford Road, you'll get to the next major intersection, which is Oak Lawn, right? And we have a group of Black developers from the community that are really trying to do a mixed use development project at the intersection of Booker Avenue and Oak Lawn Avenue, right there at Beatty's Ford Road. Um, we also have some public some city owned land there that we're looking to do a public space uh, activation there. So that will be community driven with community input. So we really need for folks to participate in that process so that we can make it really reflective of what the community would like to see. And as you continue up the corridor, you get to Betty's Ford and LaSalle. Back, back up. I'll back up. I'm getting excited too. So Oakland and Betty's Ford Road, um, we're, we're currently reviewing that project. Uh, it's not soup yet. That we're putting all the ingredients in the pot uh, so that we can make an announcement hopefully soon. There's still work to be done for sure, but I'm excited mm -hmm. about that project on that corner. Um, that complements hopefully the development of the historic Excelsior Club um, that we're working on as well. And we're making some progress in terms of really working with the water tower. I can't talk about that yet, but uh, I think the, the residents should know that that corner of Baby's Fort Road and Oak Line. Uh, if we cross out and do the right things and make sure that the numbers work and the developer does his part, which is really unique because these are individuals that live in the community that's investing in the community themselves. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and um, uh, again, you know, that's probably more summer, early fall, um, but. Um, a lot of work is happening on that corner. So keep on walking up the corner. All right. All right. So then uh, we focus a lot in nodes for the quarters of opportunity and focus on those major intersections. So our next major intersection would be Betty's Ford and LaSalle. Um, and at that intersection, we have two developments that will be coming online um, that are being spearheaded by eFix development through Chris Dennis. Um, in addition, we will be doing an intersection project at that intersection. So right now, if you go down, you'll see all of the street lights on wires going across the intersection. Uh, we're going to open that up. Uh, we've done, we've looked at research studies that have proven for healthy corridors uh, that you want to open up the areas. You want to open up intersections, provide access and without lines that are obstructing you from seeing the beautiful sunshine and trees and sky. Uh, so in order to support that, we will be putting the signals on mast arms, which will also complement the work that was done at Oaklawn Avenue some time ago. Um, in addition, we have some more uh, traffic signals that are going in uh, as a result of a pedestrian study that was done by CDOT um, to make sure that we're providing a safe walking and biking environment for our residents. Um, and some of the other things that you wouldn't necessarily see in the built vertical environment. Um, great corridors are made up of great people, right? So we're also investing in the people. We're doing asset-based community development work. Uh, we have our urban main street pr program that'll work with our small business owners. Uh, we have a Charlotte Equity Fellowship Program that is really working with grassroots organizers and having them to understand how do you best work with community um, and build consensus amongst community. Uh, so all of those pieces are coming together in collaboration with all of the city departments uh, to make sure that we're doing revital revitalization in a way that's comprehensive and holistic. So, so we, um, Chris Dennis, great guy, did a lot of great work, has two properties that he's controlling one he's already broken ground on um, and there's going to be a chase bank there right yes so chase bank is coming so that 
I was one of the questions in the in the queue. So that's a done deal, and he's working on the other side of the street um, to to make that pop as well. And, and Ms. Wyman didn't mention it, but on Cluster Avenue, uh, could you talk about the RFP that that went out? Uh, yes, so actually the housing department released two RFPs. Uh, there will be two developments right there at LaSalle Street on Custer Avenue. It will be, or Custer Street, it will be a... Oh, and I would be remiss to not mention the support of the Westside Land Trust to bring three affordable units to Gilbert Street. Um, which is how we're building in long-term affordability for homeowners. Okay, well, so that's going to be a major, I mean, um, intersection improvement. We didn't talk about cure violence, which is actually kind of doing some uh, um, grassroots um, community um, um, work along with um, grassroots organizations in terms of really trying to work with our, our community organizations and nonprofit organizations to really get a grip on some of the um, the crime in the area alongside uh, CMPD. Uh, and so that's on the ground. So a lot of things are, are about to happen on that corridor, uh, on that intersection that's really exciting. Absolutely. And um, like I said, again, February the 4th at 630, uh, please tune in. Uh, we'll have Lacey Williams to come and speak about uh, the community safety efforts around cure violence. Um, we also have Safe Charlotte, which the manager committed a million dollars uh, to support uh, nonprofit organizations that are doing safety, community safety work and violence prevention work in the area. Um, we also have Erin Gillespie that'll talk more about our Urban Main Street program. We're very close to having a host organization selected for that. Um, so there are a lot of things that are in the mix at LaSalle Street and on Betty's Ford. And it's really just important for communities to come out, understand how all of these things interplay and connect and how they can also get involved. Because like the manager said, this isn't it, right? And the way that we came to decisions on projects that are moving forward was looking at previous engagement efforts, previous times when community came out and spoke and said, this is what we want. So we need for that momentum to continue. And as we receive additional funding, we'll be able to just keep going forward. Sure, can you talk about broadband on, on Betty's Fort Road, Wi-Fi, what we do this, this year? Man, so there's a program called Access Charlotte. Uh, oh which, <laughs> I know, that's that's why we have to have this meeting. Um, Access Charlotte is a program that was launched this year. It does provide free Wi-Fi access, and we have locations along Betty's Fort Road. Uh, first, starting at Five Points, which will be connected to the Five Points Plaza Park. In addition, we have um, a location at LaSalle Street, and we have a location at uh, Tate Street, which is right across from CMPD Metro, um, that will broadcast out Wi-Fi for the communities that surround it. Cool. So if you were a small business owner uh, and you were looking for support or grant funding to relocate along Bates Fort Road, is there a program? What, what should that person do? Uh, so First and foremost, you will want to reach out to our economic development department. Um, and we don't necessarily have grants that are available to help folks to relocate um, to a corridor. Typically, when you hear about relocation dollars within the city, it's recruiting larger companies coming into the city. Uh, but we do have our business matching grant program, which is managed by Aaron Gillespie. And that program provides grants for interior upfit. Um, to do safety and security work, as well as facade improvements. So if you see a location that you want to locate to uh, within the corridor, you can contact Aaron, and that is a reimbursement program. So you spend the money to do the work, and the city will reimburse you for the work that you've completed. Okay. One question was for us to, to back up a little bit uh, <sighs> and talk a little bit about where we are with the historic Excelsior Square. Um, so I can give you more information about the Historic Excelsior Club at the meeting on February the 4th, um, but I don't have a lot of finalized details that I'm able to share tonight. Okay, so we're, we're still moving, right? And, and it's moving, yes. from my perspective, a, a little slow, to be honest. Um, but um, again, um, we're going to work on that as well. Um, a lot has to do with the developer, not the city. Uh, I think the city's ready to go uh, and, and move forward. So um, hopefully on the 4th, um, there will be uh, more more information coming on that. 
uh, food desert, healthy food options. Um, we, we, we're working towards those things as well. Can you comment on that about the um, what's happening there? Um, so food deserts in general is a focus of the city of Charlotte. Um, it's really a focus for those areas that don't have access to healthy food options in general. Um, I don't know if you saw the recent article, they are gonna have a farmer's market to open over in Camp North End, um, not Beatty's Ford, but on the west side, the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition um, is working to bring forward phase one of their food co-op grocery store, um, as well as that would support their urban farm initiative that they have right there on West Boulevard. Um, so that con conversation continues to be had, is definitely on the radar for the city of Charlotte. And as we see opportunities to um, address issues of food insecurity or food access, I will definitely move on those. And last question, then we'll get you off the hot seat. Um, <laughs> any proposals for the abandoned building at the corner of Mitch Street and, and West Trade? Proposals from me, like, what do you mean by proposals? That you, uh, there's a question that came in um, from uh, from a resident. Any proposals for the abandoned building at the corner of Mint Street and West Trade? I'm trying to locate it myself now, visually. We might have to get back to that question with you. Uh, yeah, if you can give me some more details, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, but I do know that the AMP site right there at West Trade, they. They are in conversations now on what to do with that property that would be to uh, the benefit of the community as well as Johnson C. Smith University. So you can look forward to some things happening there. Cherry, a lot's happening on the corridor. Um, within, I, I, would, I would call and say that by May of this year, there's gonna be so many major announcements and project completion along the corridor that it really gives us an opportunity to celebrate uh, and to um, see what's next, right? We just can't stop there. We still got some issues that we have to deal with up and, and down the corridor. We, rec we recognize that, but sometimes you have to stop and celebrate progress, and we are making progress along the corridor. I want to thank you and your team for, for what you're doing uh, with the Quarters of Opportunity Program, and uh, you're now off the hot seat. Thank you very much, sir, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of District 2, I, I'd like to close out by thanking each and every one of you for the opportunity to serve you uh, for the last year. Uh, last year was really, really difficult. Um, we got sworn in uh, in December, uh, and then we were out of the office because of COVID-19 three months later, working remotely. So I didn't have the opportunity to uh, to go to neighborhood meetings, uh, to go to church, to go to other community activity because of the, um, the pandemic and it really made working uh, and communicating really hard. So I hope that this was a, a good update session for you. Uh, we know that District 2 is a, a big district. Um, throughout this year, we are focusing on three primary areas. I know we talked a lot about Bays for World tonight, um, but throughout the year, we're gonna be focusing on Mountain LLA uh, Coolwood, certainly the Dorada area, as well as other sections of District 2 that have a lot of projects going on as well, or activities going on that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, we understand it. Um, it was not highlighted tonight, but it did not go overlooked. So uh, stay tuned for um, more uh, information coming um, from me in terms of what we're going to do next. Um, like I said earlier, we're going to probably do a lot more neighborhood specific type of outreach uh, where we go to different neighborhoods and just have a neighborhood centric type of community conversation less than a town hall. So I wanna thank all my guests tonight for being a part of what we have done in terms of trying to communicate directly to the citizens of District 2, uh, Pamela Lyman, uh, our city manager, Marcus Jones, uh, our transit uh, cat CEO, um, the police chief, all for, for being a part of this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, if you need me, uh, the easiest way to reach me is email me at malcolm.gram at charlottenc.gov. Um, you can leave a comment uh, on my Facebook page, which we are uh, streaming this um, town hall meeting on as well. Uh, or you can just call me directly at City Hall. Again, my name is Charlotte City Council Malcolm Graham, representing District 2. Thank you very much. May God bless you all.
Good night.